uh, for this morning. Um, Professor Eva Pils, uh, Professor Li Ling, Professor Lin Fong, uh, and, uh, um, and indeed uh, my, my dear colleague, Dr. Saskia Ufnago, who is a reader in European criminal law, will be the one uh, chairing uh, this panel uh, this morning. So Saskia, many thanks for uh, uh, having kindly accepted to, to make sure that we all behave and that uh, and as part of this panel. So I, we, I, I do rely on you for this and uh, the floor the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much for the kind introduction, Mathieu. Um, welcome to um, this um, seminar, which um, promises to become a very interesting discussion. Um, we have eminent speakers, as Mathieu already said, Professor Lin Feng from the City University Hong Kong, um, who will um, present on criminal justice uh, cooperation um, with Hong Kong and the um, national security laws in particular. Um, Mathieu Bonnet, who obviously couldn't thank himself, but I do so. Um, thank you, Mathieu, also for presenting today, um, who will look at the EU-China Criminal Justice Corporation. Um, we have Dr. Li Ling, um, who will talk um, on the structure of judicial dependence in China with implications for EU-China Judicial Corporation. And she's currently at the University of Vienna, but um, has worked in many places around the world before, um, including um, the US. And Professor Dr. Eva Pills from King's College London, who will talk about the main human rights issues in the Chinese criminal justice system. So um, we start um, the day off with Professor Ling Feng, and we will um, have 20 minutes for speakers. Um, but most importantly, after each talk, we will have at least 10 minutes for um, questions. And um, you, I, I urge you to please um, take that opportunity and ask the speakers about their presentations. Um, this, is, this is mostly about um, your interaction with the speakers um, than the presentations. And um, Professor Lin Feng, the floor is yours. Thank you, Chair. And I'd also like to thank uh, Matthew for bringing us into this uh, meaningful project. Let me share my, uh, just a minute. Want to share the screen. Oh, come, I can't, where is it? My apology for not being able to share the screen. I don't know what happened, but I will talk about it. So the topic I've chosen or I've put here is from the extradition bill to the national security law, their impacts on judicial cooperation in criminal matters between the EU and Hong Kong. Uh, the reason to choose this topic is because uh, the extradition bill uh, introduced by the Hong Kong government has led to the uh, anti-extradition movement. And uh, that movement led to the enactment and the implementation of the national security law, and uh, which has led to the suspension of bilateral extradition treaties between uh, many EU states uh, with uh, Hong Kong. So, that's the reason I put them together. So I will talk a little bit about the uh, extradition bill itself and then 
uh, mainly its uh, main contents and uh, four issues. Uh, then a bit about the extradition bill uh, movement itself, and then move on to NSL, okay, and the possible impacts on extradition. So those who paid attention to Hong Kong, we all know that the government in Hong Kong introduced the extradition bill in February 2019. And the idea is to make a case by case a surrender of a fugitive offender to Taiwan possible. So that was the government's steady goal. But many people in Hong Kong doubted whether that's the true intention of the government. Okay. Because uh, many of them are of the view that the government, the actual intention of the government is to uh, make extradition to mainland China possible. So if you look at the bill itself, it's very clear and only a few uh, sections in it. Uh, the purpose as stated is to surrender on a case by case basis, okay? Uh, between Hong Kong and any other jurisdictions with which Hong Kong has not reached a bilateral extradition agreement. So uh, Taiwan and Hong, uh, mainland China are included there. Okay. So that's the whole idea about the bill and uh, safeguards of uh, human rights in the two existing uh, legislation relating to extradition will apply to the case by case surrender of fugitives. So after the bill was introduced, then various issues were raised about the bill. The first I've mentioned already, the, the intention, whether it's actually to uh, surrender the fugitive to Taiwan or the real intentions to make surrender to mainland China possible. Okay. That was because many people in Hong Kong have reservation about uh, human rights protection uh, in the judicial system in China, in mainland China. So that was the, the first issue. Despite the government's explanation and the people still don't believe uh, government's true intention. So that's the first issue. The second issue uh, relating to the bill is uh, whether the case by case extradition is necessary versus the, uh, whether Hong Kong should uh, adopt the approach just to have long-term uh, arrangement, that is the bilateral agreement. So for this issue and the government's explanation is that because the negotiation and the conclusion of bilateral agreement takes time. So it's necessary to have an arrangement under which case-by-case case surrender of fugitive is possible. So looking from the pure design of uh, the system, the case-by-case case arrangement can actually supplement the long-term bilateral extradition agreements. So the two should coexist ideally, but the real issue people debate heavily is whether a case-by-case -case arrangement should be made with men and China. So that's the real issue. And the people hold sharp different views uh, in Hong Kong uh, on that. Okay. So that's the second issue uh, relating to the bill. The third issue is about the adequacy of uh, human rights safeguards uh, under the uh, case by case uh, surrender arrangement that is under the extradition bill. And some have criticized saying that if you look at the bill itself, uh, basically no provisions are on human rights protection. But the government's argument is that because the two existing legislation uh, relating to extradition contain all those human rights uh, protection uh, provisions, and uh, all those will apply uh, to case by case uh, surrender. Yeah, so there, therefore it's not necessary to uh, duplicate those uh, human rights protection provisions uh, 
under the extradition bill. So that's the argument. But uh, that was still an issue because some judges and the pr practitioners ra raised the concern that, in their words, they say the extradition extradition bill will put the courts on a collision course with Beijing because there will be a limited scope of extradition hearing and which will leave them a little room to maneuver. So that's uh, the concern expressed by some practitioners and uh, some judges. Okay. So my view on this point is that the collision argument is a bit exaggerated because in the previous uh, arguments or the issues relating to the interpretation of the basic law, the collusion arises because both the courts in Hong Kong and the MPCSC have authority to interpret the basic law. Whereas under the uh, for extradition cases, it's only relating to the interpretation of local legislation. So there's no role for the MPCSC to interpret the, law, the uh, extradition bill if it would be enacted. So that's the uh, third issue. And the fourth issue is hardly discussed by people. Is possible, what I call the positive contribution of the extradition bill because the reason I mentioned this is because between Hong Kong and China, actually before the handover in 1997, uh, both jurisdictions have talked about uh, uh, an arrangement, a long-term arrangement on surrender of fugitives. But they failed because there were two uh, stumbling blocks uh, during the negotiation. One is the application of the principle of uh, non-extradition in death penalty cases. And uh, the other is non-extradition for political offenses. So those, on those two issues, two sides could not agree. But under the extradition bill, actually those two, two principles will apply. And if the extradition bill could be enacted into a law, that will actually pave the way for the conclusion of a bilateral arrangement between Hong Kong and mainland China, and to remove those two main obstacles. But anyhow, because of the huge debate in Hong Kong, so the bill uh, failed eventually. And the bill led to the anti-extradition movement. And from the very beginning, when the bill was first introduced, there were only a few thousand uh, demonstrators. And that was uh, in late February. But by June, and uh, we, mid early June, we've seen, according to the report, media report, uh, one million pe people uh, took to the street uh, to be against the bill. And by the mid of the June, it's reported about 2 million uh, people uh, took to the street. So eventually in early July, uh, the chief executive announced it, the bill was dead. So that's the movement, but the movement it did not stop there because you all know it only ended in early 2020. And actually by late uh, 2019, a violent demonstration had become a sort of routine practice, you can say, in many different districts in Hong Kong. And the movement was the most violent uh, in actually Hong Kong's history. And the movement has led the, the Chinese government to worry about the security issue in Hong Kong. And eventually uh, they enacted the MP, uh, national security law for Hong Kong and which uh, was implemented since uh, on the 30th of 2020. So now more than a year and a half, it's year and a half now. 
So after the uh, implementation, so various issues have uh, been debated about the uh, implementation of the national security uh, law. So I will just pick up a few issues to uh, discuss. So the NSL itself laid down four crimes, okay? their secession, uh, subversion, terrorism, and collusion with foreign countries. And uh, what's actually very important under the bill is for as far as China is concerned is the establishment of national security, security organization in Hong Kong. And that connects the national security organization and the, the which is the, uh, the National Security Commission okay, they established in Hong Kong. And uh, they also established the Hong Kong National Security Committee. Okay. And uh, the bill also mentioned the, uh, the law, NSL mentioned the extraterritorial effect, which I will talk about in a minute. And also the uh, exercise of jurisdiction by uh, mainland uh, judicial organs. So a few issues which have been before our courts in Hong Kong. And I think the one, the first issue which is likely to be or still need the clarification from the, our courts in Hong Kong in the coming years is the scope of the various crimes. And particularly uh, with regard to a subversion and a collusion with uh, foreign countries. Collusion may be even more necessary because if you have a look at Article 29 uh, of the law and artic under Article 29, uh, there are three uh, sub articles there or subsections that mention about, for example, uh, seriously disrupting the formulation and implementation of laws and policies by Hong Kong as they are, and uh, rigging or undermining an election in Hong Kong, or imposing sec sanctions or blockade. So those would all be classified or defined as uh, possible offenses of collusion, okay? So that needs future clarification by the courts. And uh, some other issues which have been discussed by the courts and uh, determined by the courts already, which is uh, so, which you can say constitute a sort of a, a change to the previous uh, common law system. Uh, two of them are most uh, obvious. One is the formal presumption of bail, which has been uh, overruled, you can say, by Article 42 of the NSL. Now, uh, the formal rule is presumption of bail. Now, actually, it's a presumption of no bail, okay? unless the court is convinced that, that the uh, suspect will not constitute a, uh, a threat to the national security. And the second is the presumption of jury trial. And now uh, the jury trial can be replaced uh, under certain circumstances by a panel of three judges on the article of 46. Okay. And another one which may change in the future is the scope of judicial review. Because there are a couple of uh, two articles under the law saying that a certain organs, their activities were not subject to judicial review. Okay. And the, I'm not much concerned or worried about extraterritorial jurisdiction in the sense that if those uh, ha acts happen overseas and if those people don't come to Hong Kong, the law will never. Uh, okay, can never be exercised uh, against them if they don't come to the jurisdiction. And uh, also uh, many people have paid attention to Article 55 of the National Security Law, which is about the, uh, the jurisdiction of the National Security Commission and also a, a few other articles under which uh, cases may be handed over to Malik Chinese uh, prosecution and courts. Uh, I'm not 
that worried because if you look at the conditions for the mainland Chinese organ to take over or exercise jurisdiction is very uh, strict. And that means there is actually, there need to be a request from Hong Kong or the commission itself. So it's unlikely any of those circumstances will ever arise. So quickly come to, let look at the possible impacts uh, on extradition. Because now some member states in EU have already suspended the extradition treaty uh, with Hong Kong uh, because of the implementation of the NSL and because of their concern over the human rights. And personally, my view is that it's really not necessary uh, to suspend uh, the uh, bilateral extradition treaty because Hong Kong has a good track record of rule of law and the judiciary is still independent uh, now, even after the implementation of the NSL. And uh, our rule of law situation, I think most people would agree that should still be a better or at least as good as in mainland China, if not better. Okay, so why suspend the bilateral agreement? And, but the possible impact I think is if the bilateral agreements were not suspended or terminated, then several issues may arise. Or two, I, I just mentioned two impacts. One is most likely in some issues that in some cases or possible cases, double criminality may become an issue of litigation because certain acts may become a crime in Hong Kong, whereas not in U UK or in other EU jurisdictions. And the other is non-extradition for political offense could become a, a legal issue in some cases, because there are some people who have fled Hong Kong to uh, other jurisdictions. So uh, those might be the two uh, possible uh, impacts. I think I'll stop here. Okay, thanks. Thank you so much. Um, can I ask the, anyone to um, ask a question now? Are there any questions? We have time. You can put your hand up. Yes, Mathieu, thank you. Happy to break the ice. I mean, thank you uh, so much, uh, uh, Professor Lin, for this presentation. Uh, um, if I may, uh, uh, ask you a question on uh, the principle of extraterritoriality as it is indeed included in the Hong Kong NSL, I mean, Article 38. Quite interestingly, I mean, the NSL goes further to uh, the ways in which extraterritoriality is applied by mainland Chinese law itself, right? I mean, because if you read Article 7 and 8, if I'm not mistaken, of the Chinese criminal law, I mean, you have the principle of a dual criminality, which is applied, namely that for, I mean, a crime committed outside, I mean, the PRC to fall under the law, I mean, there is indeed the recognition, there is indeed a need for the same crime to be recognized in the foreign jurisdiction. And this principle of dual criminality is not included in Article 38 of the, of the NSL. So do you see this as a kind of new trend, which will be followed by other laws, uh, um, being also other laws adopted by mainland China? Or is dual criminality, is the principle implied in the NSL? I mean, this is an argument which has been put forward by uh, some uh, professors. I mean, uh, in I know from uh, uh, China University of Political Science and Law, who said that the dual criminal that the dual criminality principle was to be implied from Article 38. What are your views on that? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Matthew, for the question. The, my view here is if you look at the Article 38 of the NSL itself, it's difficult to argue that dual criminality uh, principle is applicable here under the national security law in Hong Kong. So purely from the national security law itself, uh, my view is that this is, uh, the law has cast actually a wide net to 
catch those people who may who, or who constitute a national security a threat or committed those uh, crimes against uh, mainland China. But having said that, when you come to the uh, extradition, because Jew criminality is primarily here, uh, in extradition, make it simple, that's the well established rule under the extradition uh, treaties. So without satisfying the Jew criminality uh, rule, basically no any of those uh, suspects cannot be extradited to Hong Kong at all. So the law uh, actually won't have a teeth, even though it has this wide extraterritorial application, but it wouldn't have a teeth to bite those suspects. So personally, that's why I said uh, during my presentation, I'm not really that worried about it. You can claim the jurisdiction, but actually, can you exercise the jurisdiction? So I don't know whether I've Thank answered you. your question. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, now that the ice is broken, Eva. Thank you so much. Um, thank you very much to Professor Lin for um, a, a very enlightening presentation. Um, I would like to ask a question, um, not about extraterritoriality, extra but uh, more about the um, local and in a sense also global effect, um, further effect of the national security legislation, like Mathieu, like Saskia, I'm here in London and um, uh, about every month or so I become aware of um, yet another member of civil society or academia in, from Hong Kong having left. Um, uh, there are many students uh, we have from Hong Kong and um, without going into too much detail, my sense is very strongly that um, there is very great concern uh, about the national security legislation. And of course, that concern is uh, fueled by some of the actual cases uh, under the national security laws, uh, such as for instance, the Tong Yen Kit case um, uh, that was decided essentially regarding um, the use of uh, that famous uh, uh, parole, that famous slogan, um, uh, liberate Hong Kong revolution of our time. Um, and um, uh, I think that um, the, the question that arises uh, from these observations for me is, uh, what is the chilling effect of the national security law? Um, uh, do you not think that uh, that needs to be taken into account uh, in its assessment. Right. Thank you, Eva, for the for the question. It, it, indeed, and uh, quite a few people, uh, many people, you can say in Hong Kong. I don't know the number, but have uh, because of their concern over the national security uh, law, and have left. And uh, we have one colleague who's who's left for uh, Australia now, so he's teaching in, in Australia. So I think for the, the concern is legitimate, I would say, because even for us uh, doing research uh, trying on this national security law and uh, looking at the nature of enactment uh, of this uh, national security law, it's in broad brush, okay? like many other Chinese or mainland Chinese legislation. So it's not detailed enough. So how wide the nest will be cast by the enforcement uh, organization, mainly by the police. And it de really depends on their interpretation of the law itself. Okay. And whether to a certain extent their enforcement of law will be guided or by the National Security Commission, I don't know. It's possible, okay, it's possible. So therefore the concern is there. That's why we are waiting to see. My personal view is that the chilling effect is certainly there, but in order to put people's mind or to ensure people 
the, the government needs to assure people that the proper balance is struck between uh, the protection of national security concerns and the protection of fundamental rights of the people. For example, the freedom of expression. Huh? People, you need to express your views. And where you draw the line that certain things are within the freedom of expression and whether it has crossed the boundary and into the violation of national security. I think certain uh, provisions or with regard to certain provisions of the national security law, it has not been drawn uh, properly yet. So there, I think that the concern is there, I, I agree. So government should do a better job in order to uh, assure people that don't worry too much. Very quick follow-up, if I may, yes. perhaps that might also be a task falling to the courts, um, which have thus far not proved um, willing really to um, be clear on the um, uh, scope of application, on the applicability and the continued um, uh, importance of uh, basic uh, constitutional rights guarantees. Think Jimmy Lai case, for example, right? Thank you. Yeah, Jimmy, yeah, Jimmy Lai case is a uh, common. Let's see what will happen there. And uh, also the uh, uh, pandemic is primary case. So I think that will, that will also be a case you can see how the, our courts will draw the line between the two. Thank you very much. Um, last question from Yu Sheng. Uh, yes, thank you, Professor Ling, and a uh, very nice presentation. Um, I would like to ask you a question relating to your conclusion. You mentioned about uh, political offense. That's, a, that's one of the reasons I think maybe some of the European countries are worried about whether they would like to continue the, the law cooperation with Hong Kong government. And uh, I think that's not only for the European countries, but I think also for other stakeholders, like for example, me, I'm Taiwanese. Um, a lot of people, I believe, when they're uh, talking about this um, protest or crisis or riot, some people will say there's a riot and it's from the Chinese government perspective. They are saying that one of the argument is they are worried. A lot of Hong Kongese are worried about whether this is a, the official funeral for one country, two system initiative. I think that is the main argument right now here that people are not, not worried about the criminal laws. They are worried about whether the, the promises of the Chinese government are, are officially break. And as a Taiwanese, we're worried about that as well because it makes the peace proposal from the People's Republic of China become more and more unlikely to believe that is, is there any official um, guarantees from the Chinese government that uh, it will only be, that the, the scope will be only confined to criminal laws or the political offense, or we can say the national security are always the issues that fighting with the, the criminal laws because uh, we can say that there are a very complicated and sophisticated uh, histories between Taiwan and China. And many people are worried about that, whether it is only for uh, criminal offense uh, matters or that also will be hugely in related to national securities and political offense. Thank you very much. Right, okay, thank you for your question. So here, my view is that if you look at the concern of the Chinese central government over issues in Hong Kong, national security has been a concern for them for many years, start from the very beginning. And if you look at the Article 23, at, during the enactment process of the basic law, because Hong Kong people raised the concern over the, the enactment of those, cri uh, uh, those crimes, because national security essentially is about the criminal law, okay, to impose those penalties. But for many in China, actually, my sense is from my talking to some officials there, is they are more concerned about actually the institution 
institutional establishment. Because prior to, or in the colonial period, there was a political unit within the police, which is in charge of the national security issue in Hong Kong. But that one was abolished before the uh, change of sovereignty. And then for, for, from what I've heard, and the central government always want Hong Kong to have a, such a unit reestablished. But uh, for two decades, that was, there was no result. And also the Chinese government, their national security, uh, they have a ministry there, okay? They, they couldn't reach, Hong, reach to Hong Kong at all. So it was always an issue for that. I think this movement against the extradition bill gave men and China the best excuse or the reason to extend the Chinese national security establishment into Hong Kong. Okay. Now that's done. And I think that has, they have a, a huge concern of the central government has been removed by the extension of its establishment into Hong Kong regarding the national security. And uh, followed, of course, we have this, uh, the recent electoral reform. And those I would call, my, I call them a sort of constitutional resetting. And it, you can argue that's a sort of resetting yeah, or de facto amendment of the basic law. So it's a sort of restructuring. And of course, under the authority of the mainland Chinese constitution, not under the basic law. So after the resetting, and uh, to answer your question directly, that resetting will make many people doubt the commitment from the Chinese government to the principle of one country, two system. And it seems that they're willing to uh, bear the blame Okay, they, they see the need, from their perspective, they see the need for the resetting. Okay. So they don't care, okay, I will reset it. I think uh, they believe, in my view, that has what happened in Hong Kong has actually exceeded their bottom line. Okay. They need to reset it. So that, whether later on, their guarantee will mean something, I think the, executive deputy director of the Hong Kong Macau Affairs saying uh, represents the Chinese attitude. That is what he said uh, in several meetings to, uh, with Hong Kong is that something like this, the more you respect the one country or the, the motherland's concern, the more autonomy you will get. So in his view, it's a sort of uh, uh, interaction actually between the two. If you don't respect me, then you will get less autonomy. I don't know whether you have answered your question properly. Thank you, Professor Lane. It is sufficient. Thank you for your yeah. answer. You're welcome. Thank you very much. What a tricky situation we're in here. Mathieu, now we go to the EU. Uh, which is also a tricky situation, but probably not as tricky as the one we have with Hong Kong. And you can take it away. Thank you very much, Saskia. I mean, can you all see my slides? Yep, all good, perfect. Uh, thank you very much, uh, um, Saskia. Again, a great pleasure to be here. Uh, many thanks to the colleagues at Leuven University for the opportunity. Um, in this presentation, uh, I would like to talk about uh, uh, criminal justice uh, cooperation between uh, EU member states uh, and China. But as the EU is never easy, right, when you talk about the European Union, you need to talk both about member states and you need to talk about the EU as a whole. So this is also something that I will be doing as part of uh, this presentation which will be divided into uh, three uh, main parts. In the first part, I would like to talk about the context in which, I mean, criminal justice cooperation is taking place between EU member states and China. Here, I would like to say a few words about the importance uh, that criminal justice cooperation has from the Chinese perspective 
in particular in the context of the ongoing fight against uh, corruption and indeed ongoing fight against corruption, which has an external dimension, an external dimension in which then you have EU member states coming in. And that will be the second part of my presentation in which I would like to make a kind of mapping of existing mechanisms in the area of criminal justice cooperation between the EU and China, knowing that as many as 10 member states of the European Union have now an extradition agreement signed and ratified with the People's Republic of China. Last but not least, I would like to look at uh, instances of contestation against EU-China criminal justice cooperation. And here I would like to talk in particular about the different ways in which a uh, 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 criminal justice cooperation has been has been increasingly contested by a number of actors within the European Union, and these include not only the European Parliament, national parliaments, but indeed increasingly a number of of EU member states courts. EU member states courts which have which have refused extraditions to the PRC on grounds of the European Convention for Human Rights and in particular uh, Article 3, the right not to be tortured and Article 6, that is the right to have access to a fair trial. So this is a little bit the menu for uh, this, uh, morning's, uh, this morning's presentation and Again, I would like here to start by giving you a little bit of a context. And the context is one in which China is, uh, the People's Republic of China is increasingly encored in the dynamics of globalization, in the dynamics of legal globalization, meaning that in practice, judicial cooperation in both civil and criminal matters is now really a necessity from the perspective of the People's Republic of China. And this necessity has been kind of translated into a number of initiatives taken by the PRC with a number of purposes, uh, uh, including the facilitation of the mutual recognition of foreign judgments, the importance to facilitate the transfer of documents and evidence, the necessity to facilitate mutual legal assistance, but also the necessity to facilitate extraditions when indeed an alleged offender is based in a third jurisdiction and when indeed the PRC would like to make sure that this person can be brought back to China for the purpose of criminal prosecution or the execution of a sentence. And indeed my presentation will focus primarily on this issue of extradition. Uh, if you want to understand the ways in which uh, extraditions uh, uh, are being regulated according to Chinese law. I mean, you do see here on this slide the relevant sources which are to be used. I mean, there is the 2000 uh, extradition law, which has not been revised uh, ever since that point. And also, quite interestingly, China is also a party to two important UN conventions, including the UN Convention Against Transnational Organized Crime, whose purpose is to facilitate judicial cooperation between the parties, including through the facilitation of extradition, that is Article 16 of that convention. And China is also a party to the UN Convention Against Corruption, which also includes the facilitation of extradition, that is Article 44 of that convention. That being said, it is also very clear that in addition to uh, the national piece, the, to the pieces of national legislation and those international treaties which have been signed and uh, ratified by China, that China has also increasingly tried to secure the adoption of bilateral ex extradition treaties. And I will come back, I will come back to that in a moment when I will talk about the existing agreements between EU member states and China. Just a few words on what has been called China's global law enforcement drive. I mean, I'm pretty sure that you've all heard about the fact that since uh, Xi Jinping came into power uh, in 2012 slash 2013, the fight against corruption within and outside China has been very much identified as a priority, as a key political priority of the Chinese Communist Party, I mean, a priority that is very much linked to uh, the CCP's attempts to 
affirm and to secure its legitimacy. So in a certain way, I mean, this uh, uh, the success of this campaign against corruption is very much defined by the party state as a way to secure and to enhance its own legitimacy. And in addition to the internal dimension of this uh, um, fight against corruption, it is very clear that there has also been a very important external dimension to it. That is the fact that uh, the party state is trying to make sure that there is no safe haven for fugitives. Nowhere in the world shall a Chinese fugitive be able to hide if indeed the party state wants this individual to be returned back to the PRC. And here, I just would like to quote uh, uh, Chinese President Xi Jinping, who stated at the occasion of the 2014 plenum of the Chinese Communist Party, we shall punish corrupt officials with zero tolerance. We should bring them back to justice, even if they flee to the farthest parts of the, of the earth. We should never let them hide in the safe heaven at large. So how now has China tried to secure it? the success of this uh, uh, global law enforcement drive. A transnational police cooperation has definitely been an important aspect of that global law enforcement drive. Uh, China has used the Interpol system of red notices extensively, I mean, in the last few years. Uh, in particular, in the year 2015, it is as many as 100 red notices which were released at once. And uh, um, this practice of using red notices has been uh, very much criticized by uh, civil society organizations and even to a certain extent by Interpol itself for the simple reason that the PRC has been accused of instrumentalizing indeed Interpol's regulations to indeed issue politically motivated red notices which actually led, for instance, Interpol to withdraw one of the uh, one of the red notices which it had released against Dolkun Isa, who is one of the main one of the main figures of the uh, Uyghur transnational movement. So a number of uh, indeed uh, red notices have indeed been withdrawn because of their alleged uh, political nature. So transnational police cooperation is definitely one important element here, but China is also using still, I mean, mechanisms that are being called persuasion to return. What are we talking about here? We are talking about Chinese public security officials traveling overseas uh, uh, in order to persuade, I mean, individuals, Chinese fugitives to go back to the PRC for trial. And here we are talking about the system which takes place even sometimes despite the existence of a bilateral in, of a bilateral extradition agreement. This happened, for instance, at least two times uh, with uh, uh, Chinese individuals based in France who were persuaded uh, through the system to go back to China, despite the existence of an extradition agreement between France and uh, the uh, People's Republic of China. Which now leads me actually to the second part of uh, this presentation in which I would like to make this kind of mapping of what exists uh, in terms of criminal justice cooperation, in particular extradition agreements between uh, the PRC and uh, member states of the European Union. As you can see here, as many as 10 EU member states, I mean, have signed and ratified extradition agreements with the PRC. France was the first EU member state to sign such an agreement, and quite interestingly, it is actually the French government which asked the PRC to have such an agreement. So it was France which was on the demand side, and indeed uh, uh, China which actually accepted to have such an extradition agreement uh, with uh, France. Another quite important element, uh, I think, to bear in mind is the fact that uh, there has been there hasn't been much democratic debate, I mean, on those extradition agreements. In sharp contrast with uh, 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 other jurisdictions, such as Australia, where the very issue of adopting or not adopting an extradition agreement with China has been heavily debated, in most uh, parliaments of national EU member states, I mean, those, ex those extradition agreements have been very much of a non-issue. So if you just take, I mean, the Belgium PRC extradition agreement, quite interestingly, not a single member of the Belgian parliament voted against that agreement. A number of members of the Belgian parliament abstained, but not a single one objected 
to the adoption of uh, these uh, of these agreements. Now you may wonder, I mean, why? I mean, why would an EU member state actually agree or be willing to adopt, I mean, extradition agreements with the PRC? I mean, there are three types of justifications which have been used or which could potentially be used to explain, I mean, the adoption of those agreements. Uh, one of them is the argument of the growing interdependence between uh, uh, EU member states and China and the very fact that the more interdependence, the more transnational uh, uh, criminality you are likely, I mean, to see emerge. And in that regard, you, I mean, you have a number of reports which have been published and which refer to the fact that the Belt and Road, the Belt and Road Initiative and the connectivity emerging out of the BRI may indeed lead to an increase in the number of transnational crimes ranging from transnational criminality, tax evasion, but also cyber criminality. So this is in a certain way, I mean, the argument in favor of transnational criminal cooperation in a context of growing interdependence, which is one of the arguments which has been used in favor of those agreements. Another argument which has been put forward is the idea that the very adoption of those agreements may indeed lead to an improvement in the procedural and substantive rights in the Chinese criminal justice system. So this idea that, I mean, the very adoption of those agreements would lead to a kind of socialization process, or at least would need to force China to comply with certain procedural and substantive rights for extraditions to take place. This is very much the kind of narrative which you could find in France at the time of the adoption of the bilateral extradition agreement. And here, I just would like to quote uh, the French uh, Senate Foreign Affairs Commission, we stated at the time, the adoption of such a convention enables to overpass the obstacles emerging from the differences between legal and judicial systems. It should also contribute to promote the rule of law in China. So you see this kind of narrative uh, has been there in a number of national parliaments who have adopted uh, those agreements. And then last but not least, and I would say probably most importantly, there is obviously the more political, uh, the more political argument. I mean, the, the very fact that uh, um, these extradition agreements have very often been negotiated as part of a broader package, a broader package of agreements and uh, contracts signed between EU member states and China. I mean, this is very clearly the case of Belgium. I mean, the agreement was signed. Uh, um, the agreement between Belgium and China was signed back in 2017 at the occasion of a state visit uh, uh, of the Belgian Prime Minister to the PRC, and this agreement was part of a broader package of, uh, indeed, the number of agreements and contracts, I mean, involving uh, Belgian corporations at the time. The same does apply, I mean, to the agreement with Greece, which was actually signed at the occasion of a state visit of the Chinese president to Greece, and in particular to the port of Piraeus, which is indeed owned by a Chinese, uh, which is now being managed by a Chinese state-owned enterprise, namely Costco. And the argument here is to say that from the perspective of a number of states, and here I just would like to quote, I mean, an article by Cho of 2018, in real political, in real politic terms, China's growing diplomatic and economic power on the global stage means that it would be extremely difficult for countries to tolerate both the absence of an extradition treaty and calls to deport Chinese fugitives. And this is actually something important to bear in mind, that is that you do not need to have an extradition agreement for extradition, for extraditions to take place. So a kind of question which I think is also important to bear in mind is, what would we be left with without those agreements? The very fact there is no agreement does not mean that no extraditions will take place. Quite an important point, I think. Now, let's turn a little bit to the contestation against those uh, uh, agreements. And here, please, Saskia, sorry, I forgot to check when I started my presentation. So how much time do I have left, please? Um, you have about two minutes left. Two minutes left. Okay, so I'll be I'll be briefer than I wanted to be then, but it's all fine. So those agreements have been uh, increasingly uh, contested, and this contestation has come from uh, various uh, actors. I mean, uh, I just would like here 
to refer uh, to, first of all, the European Parliament, European Parliament, which adopted the resolution in September 2021, a resolution aimed to present, I quote, a new EU-China strategy. It is also as part of this new EU-China strategy that the EU also called for the first time China as a systemic rival. So this is now the kind of language and indeed a, a vocabulary used uh, in the context of the so-called strategic partnership between the European Union and China. And as part of this resolution, indeed, the European Parliament called uh, 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 member states which continue to have extradition treaties with China to suspend individual extraditions to the PRC wherever the extradition of an individual puts them at risk of torture and so on and so forth. A similar kind of call came uh, from uh, the Belgian parliament and I put uh, uh, the resolution here in Dutch for the students uh, back uh, in Leuven. I mean, resolution of the European, of the Belgian parliament, which related to uh, the, uh, what was called by the Belgian parliament, the genocide against, I mean, uh, Uyghur communities uh, in Xinjiang. As part of this uh, resolution, there was a call by the Belgian parliament to the Belgian government to actually suspend, I mean, the, uh, the extradition agreement between the Kingdom of Belgium uh, and uh, China. Last but not least, and I think, and I'm pretty sure, and I hope to be honest, that this is also something on which uh, Eva will come back to during her presentation. Uh, that is the fact that we have indeed an emerging case law with a number of courts from uh, ECHR member states of parties to the European Convention of Human Rights actually refusing extraditions to the PRC on grounds of uh, the European Convention for Human Rights. And I would like here to refer in particular to uh, decisions, to re recent decisions by the Supreme Court of Sweden, who decided back in 2019 that uh, the extradition of a particular individual would be in conflict with Article 2, the right to life, Article 3, prohibition of torture, and Article 6, right to a fair trial. And actually, uh, um, this is this was the first time that a court, that a Supreme Court in an ECHR member state was actually refusing an extradition to the PRC on the basis of the ECHR. And since this Swedish decision, I mean, there has been a number of cases, including a case before the Czech a constitutional court, as well as a case before the Polish uh, Supreme Court. One more minute and then uh, I'm done. Uh, sorry, Saskia, for uh, taking a little bit more time uh, than, uh, uh, than I should have. Um, an important element uh, to bear in mind is that very often as part of those uh, uh, extradition cases, uh, China submits diplomatic assurances. Diplomatic assurances, which are indeed uh, conditions or commitments that China makes in terms of the ways in which, I mean, those individuals to be extradited would be treated if they were to be extradited. And here, um, I just would like to put three question marks around three important facts uh, or three important questions that are to what extent can, I mean, diplomatic assurances submitted by the PRC eliminate completely the dangers to the individuals concerned? Second, what is the reliability of those assurances knowing what China's own record in terms of its commitments, in terms of its compliance with its own international human rights obligations. And last but not least, how can we effectively monitor, I mean, the respect by the PRC of those diplomatic assurances? Conclusions. Multiplicity of normative battlegrounds in the context of EU-China relations. Quite interestingly, criminal justice cooperation does demonstrate or does show us that human rights are no longer only being discussed at the highest political levels, for instance, as part of the EU-China human rights dialogue. But now that we have a multiplicity of actors coming at play, including courts of national EU member states, which is definitely an interesting development from that perspective. The second element uh, is, I think, that in the context of EU-China relations, it has become increasingly difficult to compartmentalize policy areas. 
as you could see from those two uh, 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 resolutions adopted by the European Parliament and by the Belgian Parliament, those resolutions were addressing many different issues at the same time. I mean, the, uh, uh, e the new EU-China strategy talked as much about the very uncertain future of the bilateral investment treaty between the EU and China, as much as it talked about the genocide against Uyghur people, as much as it talked about the extradition agreement. All those issues are now being intertwined and are now being interlinked as part of EU-China relations. Um, and I will finish, I will finish with this one. My apologies for time management here and many thanks for your attention. Looking forward to uh, your questions. Thank you so much, Mathieu. Um, any questions? It's a very thought-provoking presentation. I see. Uh, um, yes. Ning Lee. Thank you, Saskia. Um, I have a factual question to Matthew. Do you have uh, statistics about how many Interpol red notice requests or extradition requests received by EU member states have been turned down and how many have been honored? Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Ling. I don't have precise statistics. Uh, what I can nevertheless say, I mean, when uh, extra actual extradition cases are concerned, I mean, if I go through the list of EU member states with an extradition agreement uh, with, uh, with China, I mean, Belgium, China, no cases yet. Uh, uh, France has extradited uh, two, uh, two individuals. There have been some cases involving Portugal with uh, extraditions actually taking place. And actually, the, and the member states of the European Union with the, of, of the European Union with the highest number of cases is actually Spain. And the main reason for that is because Spain has indeed, I mean, authorized the extradition of as many as 121 Taiwanese suspects of, uh, to the PRC. I mean, an extradition of 121 uh, Taiwanese uh, suspects, which has been denounced not only by civil society organizations, but indeed by the UN High Commissioner uh, for Human Rights. In terms of recent cases, I mean, the most uh, uh, um, visible, let's say, uh, uh, denials of extraditions came from uh, Poland, the Czech Republic and Sweden. Um, there are a number of pending cases uh, before other jurisdictions whose outcome is not known as of now. And there have also been, I mean, some extraditions uh, taking place between uh, 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 EU member states and who do not have an extradition agreement uh, with the PRC that is uh, indeed Hungary, among others. So, uh, so sorry for not being as systematic as I would have been, but indeed this is just to give you a kind of a kind of overview of what has been going on there. A uh, very quick um, question from from Feng Lin um, before moving on. Thank you. Uh, I just have a quick question uh, regarding the diplomatic assurances. I think it's fair to say it's difficult, the reliability and the monitoring of it. And uh, I just wonder from your research, because there are 10 jurisdictions in EU who have concluded the bilateral agreement with China extradition. And uh, I assume some of them must have done the extradition already. So I just wonder whether there are any, uh, in your research in Canada, any political uh, diplomatic assurance given by China which have not been followed. Because I know there's one case, for example, from Canada, they extradited that guy to mainland China. And I, I, we don't know, we haven't followed, heard anything thereafter about it. This is this is a very good uh, this is a very good question. So so far, I mean I'm not aware of uh, any extradition case where, I mean, the sending case, I mean, came up to realize after the extradition that the diplomatic assurances had been breached. 
that being said, I mean, that being said, I mean, there is obviously the very question of how can a sending state ensure or monitor the extent to which diplomatic assurances have been complied with by the PRC. And I'm thinking here in particular about, I mean, uh, diplomatic assurances relating to certain uh, uh, issues, such as torture, for instance, which can hardly be monitored. Uh, um, that is, uh, uh, um, and, and here the threshold, I mean, set by the European Convention of Human Rights is quite high, right? I mean, uh, the, 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 there is a recognition that the very monitoring of uh, uh, the prohibition of torture, I mean, is, is a difficult one and necessitates very much a kind of permanent type of monitoring. Permanent type of monitoring, which is obviously uh, uh, um, very difficult. I mean, we know that consular access, I mean, to uh, prisoners in Chinese prisons is definitely, I mean, an important, uh, an important uh, issue that is uh, that is that is still there. Uh, um, and so torture is definitely, I mean, an easier, uh, a way more difficult diplomatic assurance to check than, for instance, the non-application of the death penalty, where it would become obviously very obvious if China was to breach its obligations. On that particular issue, I mean, I'm only aware of one case involving, I mean, uh, uh, um, involving China and Thailand back in the 1990s, where apparently there were diplomatic assurances submitted by China committing to the fact that the death penalty would not be applied. And then indeed, the person, that individual was sentenced to death. Uh, um, and, and the last point, uh, if I may, I think that there is, uh, it is despite, I mean, the, 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 uh, despite the fact that I'm not aware of any cases where diplomatic assurances have been recently breached by the PRC, I think that if we want to assess the, reli the reliability of uh, assurances submitted by the PRC these days, it is also important to broaden up the spectrum and to also look at the different ways in which China has complied or not complied with its own obligations under international law in other instances. Thanks. Thank you very much, Mathieu. We also have a very interesting question on um, the follow-up judgments of Chinese courts post-extradition in the chat, but I would ask you to answer that actually in the chat because we need to move on. We'll do. And um, I am opening the floor for Dr. Li Ling and um, her follow-up. The, the important um, problem of judicial independence. Okay, can you, can you see the slides? Okay, great. Uh, thank you, Saskia, for the kind introduction at the beginning. And uh, it's a pleasure to meet Matthew and Professor Lin Feng for the first time at the panel. And it's nice to see Eva again. Uh, so my topic is focused on the domestic judicial politics in China, in particular about judicial dependence in China. Uh, as, as Matthew has explained in much greater details. Uh, the question about judicial independence or the lack of it is one of the matters uh, that uh, is often examined in EU member states, either for criminal matters and civil matters. Uh, but my question here is judicial dependence, about judicial dependence, is first we need to establish what is a symptom of judicial dependence in China. It's a dependence on who? Here will the, the common explanation or description of judicial dependence in China has two aspects. One is internal, the other is external. In the internal dependence means uh, judges who actually hear the case uh, do not necessarily have the decision-making power to rule on the case, but uh, the, the, the judges can propose a decision uh, to a superior judges in the court and have to have the superior uh, su 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 
uh, superior judges to sign off uh, the, the proposed decision before the decision can be officially issued. And regarding external dependence, there are multiple sources of dependence. One is state organs, and for a long time, the local state organs, uh, in particular, the, uh, the government is responsible to finance courts. And there's also the dependence upon the party because the party sits even above the state organs. They have to authorize the court uh, to, do, to, to give them the power to do things that they are currently doing. And there's also dependence upon the higher courts. Here, the relationship between the appellate courts and the lower courts is not the same that you have in the Western legal systems, because in China, the appellate courts uh, uh, do have not only the supervisory power to examine uh, uh, judicial rulings of lower courts uh, on a case by case basis, they are also responsible to supervise or instruct lower courses on judicial policies to uh, examine or, and evaluate the performances of lower courts and to influence and in some cases decide on the uh, judicial appointments of lower courts. So here uh, to find a common cause for all these different aspects of judicial dependence in China's courts, uh, one thing that is uh, yearly uh, attributed or contributed to is the party state structure. So because the party, uh, because the court is embedded in this party state structure, uh, which has a goal to preserve the political control of the party over the state and the society, that's why we have uh, all these different uh, aspects of judicial dependence in China. So basically party state is the most common uh, attributing factor to all the problems that Chinese courts are experiencing. Uh, my question regarding this conclusion uh, is twofold. One is about the actualization of the political control over courts. Uh, we know in China's courts, it has uh, they have combined uh, annual caseload of 30 million cases uh, per year. So how is the party going to monitor the, uh, the adjudication of so many cases? Uh, that's my question. What is the operating mechanism of the political control of the party over all these courts. And another question uh, arises uh, because of an uh, observed paradox about judicial dependence and judicial autonomy that we see uh, from China's courts. Uh, judicial dependence is what I have just uh, uh, described. And there's also a measure of autonomy, which is uh, manifested in the high level of judicial corruption that we see in China's courts. Because to have judicial corruption, you have to have some power to corrupt, Right? So there's has, there has to be a level of judicial autonomy that judges enjoy so that they can corrupt, they can misuse this power for private interests. So how to explain this paradox? And the answers, current answers that we have is one is focusing on the party political legal committee. Uh, the party political legal committee is a specialized party uh, apparatus who is responsible to supervise and coordinate the performance and activities of all legal institutions, including police, courts, procuratories, and the ministry uh, and bureaus of justice. Uh, but to blame everything on the party political legal committee is uh, to some extent unfunded because uh, a lot of research have shown that political, uh, the party political legal committee, especially at the lower levels are not as powerful as one may think. First, they suffer from staff shortage. Uh, in the study about a county level political legal committee, their office, which 
uh, is responsible to supervise court activities has only two personnel. And uh, they also suffer from authority deficiency. Uh, and because uh, we know the, the, the head of the police bureau enjoys a lot of power, they have a lot of uh, manpower and a lot of money to enforce the law. And the political legal committee head does not necessarily have the power to summon them. When the political legal committee wants to have a meeting, the, the head of the police bureau doesn't even respond to such summoning. So they do not have that much of power as we may imagine at the local level in particular. And uh, the political legal committee also suffers from mandate overloads uh, there, uh, because the political legal committee shares the same office, the same uh, so they, they are also the uh, they are also responsible for social uh, stability maintenance, which has a lot of things to do with uh, uh, surveillance, uh, supervision of social protests, and these kind of matters, which does not have a direct implication on the court's activities. And the actual main force that they can share to deal with court issues is very limited. It uh, actually takes only a minor proportion in all its mandates and resources that they have been given to spend. Uh, so the other common attribution to the problems that I have just described about, about the performance of China's courts is about the uh, monopolization of the judicial appoint, appointment power and the power for budgetary appropriation uh, in the hand of the party. But here, this explanation also has some minute, uh, limits because uh, appointment, having the appointment power does not necessarily mean uh, lifelong control of the appointee. Someone has to make the appointment, right? In the Western legal system, uh, judges are either appointed by someone or elected by someone or some community. Uh, so, but this does not necessarily necessarily mean the appointing body of the electorate has lifelong control of their appointees. And we can find a lot of examples for that. Uh, so there has to be some other mechanism to control uh, the judges after they have been appointed to their posts. Uh, another limit for this explanation is uh, a disproportionate high level of political compliance that we see among Chinese judges. Uh, it's always shocking when I read comparative literature uh, about uh, courts in other authoritarian regimes. And very often when I see they have occasionally judges who can display tremendous political defiance, defying the instruction from uh, uh, top politicians and uphold the rule of law. Uh, this is shocking for me because in China, we see literally zero cases of the same character. So how do we explain this extremely high level of political compliance with a very limited monitoring resources spent in uh, supervising the Chinese courts? Uh, another uh, level of analysis of the Chinese legal system is the structural analysis. Here we have several frameworks that have been used. One is dual state, which I believe uh, is used by Eva. Uh, this framework uh, borrows the uh, uh, Franco's uh, analysis of the Nazi regime, uh, where you have a, a prerogative uh, regime governing certain political matters and then you have a normative regime that governs uh, economic and also other social spheres. And there's also the framework proposed by uh, Professor Fu Hualing, uh, which uh, divides the legal system into law, actual law, actual, actual law, uh, which governs different uh, uh, matters that are handled by the courts. 
And there's also dual normative system, which is uh, something I have written uh, six years ago. Uh, here, I divide the legal system into two normative systems. One is uh, one features uh, laws passed by the state and used by the state system, and the other is the norms uh, uh, in state, uh, issued by the party. And there's also another framework which divides a legal regime within a legal system uh, proposed by William Hurst. Uh, and he described, uh, uh, divide the criminal system and civil system, meaning different matters are governed by different uh, uh, legal regimes. But all these uh, frameworks uh, are silent about one issue, which is the mechanism of the interactions between the normative legal regime or system and the more political or prerogative uh, legal system or the prerogative political component of the system. How do they inter interact? And what is the relationship between the two different spheres that they respectively govern. Uh, so is the civil and criminal legal regime, are they segregated? And the political sensitive, sensitive cases and regular, uh, regular cases, are they segregated? Uh, meaning, do we know a clear demarcation of what is political sensitive cases and what is a regular? Uh, the same goes with the dual state framework. And I ask these questions because in reality, what we see is more of a fusion between politics and law. Uh, here, the political sensitive, sensitive cases has a very ambiguous character. Basically, any type of cases can, be, can turn out to be a political sensitive case in the process of adjudication. And uh, judicial injustice is so widespread across the, uh, the, the judicial system, it's not only limited to politically sensitive cases or uh, regarding uh, human rights issues. And there's a, a false perception of judicial autonomy in civil and commercial cases uh, because uh, it's a common uh, uh, analysis that the legal component is predominant in civil and commercial cases. And it's only in criminal cases where we see a heavy uh, influence from the political factors. But uh, if you look at the one, one typical example is this uh, mining rights case uh, uh, with high stake uh, and the case in nation from uh, the northern Shanxi province, which is full of mines. And uh, this case has been going on for more than 10 years and has reached the Supreme People's Court. And from the beginning to the end, at every step of the case, you can see the footprint or rather the fingerprint of political intervention from very tall politicians, including judicial officials to the lower level of officials. So civil and commercial cases is not immune or insulated from political intervention. So now my to explain all this uh, seemingly paradoxical uh, observation, I have some uh, hypothesis which I would like to share with you uh, and it's still work in progress. So I'd like to hear some crit criticism as well. Uh, the first hypothesis is there's a alternative order that's going on uh, this alternative, uh, alternative order means some order that has nothing to do with law. And uh, this alternative law order is integral, organic, and permittive rather than being an exogenous and invasive uh, political factor that 
only occasionally encroach upon the legal order. Instead, it's integral, intertwined with the legal order and per, uh, it's permitted throughout uh, the, the, the judicial system. And the third hypothesis is the functional neutrality about this alternative order. It means it can be used to serve the political goals of the party, but it has a neutral function, which means when it is uh, uh, got hold of by someone else that does not bear the same political interests of the party, it can be used or misused for this person's personal interests, which leads to judicial corruption as well. And the last feature of uh, this alternative order in my hypothesis is this order should be legible, which means it should be easy to read and recognize and it's self-enforceable, which means you don't need a lot of monitoring resources to enforce this order. And in my uh, ongoing research, I identify the administrative ranking system as this alternative order. And what is the administrative ranking system? It's a single power structure that regulates three types of political uh, power relations in basically all key uh, political subsystems in China. The first such system is uh, regarding central local relations. The second dimension is elite politics, which means the power relations between political elites. And the third dimension is relations between the party and the state. So what does this uh, ARS uh, administrative ranking system looks like uh, to over, uh, in the risk of oversimplifying the matter which has to be done uh, within the time limits? Uh, it, this is a typical pyramidal power structure, uh, administrative division structure in China where you have five levels and uh, they have a constant uh, concentric relationship, which means from the bottom, the township answers to the county, the county answers to the prefecture, and all the way to the center. So in this way, the central authority can uh, uh, command thousands of townships at the grassroots level through this chain of command. We have some... about one minute left, sorry. Okay. Uh, well, uh, and at the, each level, you have several uh, state uh, organs and party institutions where the political party, uh, uh, the party state relationship is regulated. And within each institution, you have a hierarchical power structure. And uh, every person now that fills in this institution, they are also ranked, governed by this. Uh, hierarchical structure. What is striking of this structure is uh, all these power relations are regulated by the same indicator of power. This is something quite unique, but I don't think I have uh, time to elaborate on all those issues, but I will try to end. Sorry, whoops. With this uh, poster, it's a very popular uh, television drama called In the Name of the People about the anti-corruption campaign uh, that was carried out uh, in the first term of Xi Jinping's rule. And uh, it's uh, to show how to understand the relationship between all the characters. Uh, someone made this chart about their relationship simply based on the administrative ranks that each uh, featured official 
in the drama has carried. Uh, so this, as if this is the most important indicator to understand uh, relationships between characters and the plots of the television drama. This is simply to show how important this administrative ranking, ranking system is. And when uh, you have a, a legible order of power that will interact with the legal order in courts. That means uh, the, the outcome of the case is not just decided by the uh, legal order. Uh, to what extent the legal order matters depends on the power relations between the courts and the litigants and other judicial supervisors. And that will determine the level of judicial autonomy and the potency of the legal order that will be applied in the case. So that's the, uh, 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 the, the, the main feature of my hypothesis. Okay, thank you for your time. Thank you so much. Um, <clears throat> in, to make um, questions and answers easier, could you please all lower your hands first? and then lower your hand again um, if you have a question that is now related to the specific talk. Any questions? If not, I shall abuse my position as chair and ask you, um, I was very, very um, interested in one of the first questions that you opened up where you said that, um, there was or <clears throat> where you weren't sure whether there was or there wasn't um, an interrelationship be between political dependence of judges and the existence of corruption. Um, would you say that there is um, that it is a contradiction, the existence of political dependence and corruption, or might it even be a consequence? Here, uh, am I still on my mic? Yes. Uh, I say it's a contradiction because uh, judicial corruption is not in the political interest of the party. Actually, the party has been adamant uh, from the beginning to end to eradicate judicial corruption. And it has introduced all these campaigns and judicial policies in order to reduce judicial corruption. And obviously it has not been very successful, even at the height of the anti-corruption campaign started in 2012, we still see high level corruption in the Chinese judiciary. And we have several cases about that. So there has to be some mechanism that is able to produce and reproduce corruption. And it's uh, one of my goals to find out what is the mechanism that keep producing uh, judicial corruption. Because if the anti-corruption uh, campaign is so powerful, at some time you should see an end or a significant reduction of corruption, how come it still comes up? Uh, so that's, it's my goal to find out uh, what is the mechanism. Thank you so much. We have time for one more question. And I see that Maria Anna has put it in the chat, but she might as well ask it live. Yeah, thank you. I wasn't sure which one was better, but um, I just wrote down that in England that the Constitutional Reform Act of 2005 made it a requirement to choose a more diverse candidate when appointing judges with the same merit. And um, this demonstrated a push for judicial diversity. And so a lot of people have argued that this would promote judicial independence. And I was just wondering if you think that there would be a similar initiative adopted in China. Thank you. Well, judicial diversity, uh, there has been some indication of that. For example, uh, uh, there's this uh, current judicial uh, reform, which is also initiated by Xi Jinping, uh, contrary to many retrogressive uh, policies that he has introduced. Uh, he uh, spearheaded the most impactful judicial reform currently in China. And one of the measure is to to be more inclusive of judges from lower courts. Uh, 
so they open some channels, uh, institutionalized channels even, to bring judges from lower courts to higher courts and to facilitate uh, more frequent uh, exchange between uh, of judges between higher and lower courts. But regarding uh, diversity, uh, individual diversity, for example, gender diversity, uh, or oh, ethnic diversity, I don't think it's uh, specified in this current judicial reform. Um, and there's certainly no diversity regarding political affiliation. Uh, that 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 that's not going to happen anytime soon. Thank you. We might have time for a very very quick last question from Feng Lin. Thanks. The question is about the you mentioned in your hypothesis the uh, administrative ranking system's importance. I just wonder from your research uh, whether you've seen any impact. Uh, from the last two rounds of uh, judicial reform to delink the judiciary from the administrative system, or you still see the sort of very strong link, and basically there is no effect of that delinking. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Lin, for the question. Uh, I was hoping there's some question from you because uh, you are an expert in this area. Uh, yes, we, we did uh, one test with administrative litigation cases to see whether because this here, every defendant, every defendant by definition in administrative litigation has a rank and the court has a rank. So we compare the rank gap between the court and defendant because the plaintiff, the, the, their rank status is homogeneous. Uh, so that's basically a constant. Then we can compare the impact uh, of the rank gap on the judicial outcome of the cases. And we found consistent uh, adherence to our hypothesis of all these cases. We analyzed uh, about 4,000 cases that took place between 2000, uh, 2015 and 2000, uh, 2018. Uh, and no, uh, I think it's 2010, 2018. Anyway, uh, we, we measured the cases uh, with uh, important timestamp, which is the most recent administrative uh, litigation reform. And we found the, the findings are consistent. Doesn't matter whether it happens before the reform or after the, the reform, which means a lower ranking court would uh, be very hesitant to rule against a higher ranking defendant. And a lower ranking court would never rule against a higher ranking court in any substantive uh, forms. Thank you so much. And without further ado, I hand over to Eva, my brave compatriot going into the realm of human rights now and unfortunately has to leave punctually. So we have to end punctually as well. Thank you so much. Thank you, Saskia. And uh, thanks to Mathieu for um, uh, EU Plant as a wonderful initiative and also to um, uh, and and I should also say that it's a real, um, really great pleasure to um, join uh, such a wonderful panel. Um, so I um, will just have a offer a few comments, um, brief comments um, on the global law enforcement drive and the problem of extraditions to China, um, and the specific challenges that, in my view, arise for legal actors outside of China uh, in the context of um, persistent uh, human rights problems affecting the criminal process and um, also their connection, of course, with the broader legal political changes that I think um, we've already heard um, so much about uh, this morning, uh, including, of course, uh, changes and um, persistent problems affecting the judiciary, as we just heard from Li Ling. Um, so I think that um, uh, to begin with, I think that um, when we um, uh, consider the current rhetoric 
uh, that uh, the party leadership is using in, 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 in relation to its um, broader international and transnational relations, I think that um, uh, while on the one hand, as we heard from Mathieu this morning, there is this um, pretty um, strident uh, language about uh, the global law enforcement drive, the need sort of to essentially um, uh, bring any fugitive, every fugitive to, to justice. Um, there's also a, um, uh, a, a, a rhetoric of connecting to the world of um, uh, signing up to conceptions of multilateralism in particular uh, that uh, has become stronger and, uh, uh, and uh, uh, Xi Jinping's, uh, in Xi Jinping's so-called new era. And I think that um, that leads on the part of international actors, the international community, um, that can quite possibly lead to um, a, a sense of ambiguity, um, a, a sense of um, confusion as to uh, whether China is trying to integrate further into uh, the international legal system, or indeed um, whether um, it is um, essentially withdrawing from uh, the principled commitments of the liberal international order. And um, I'm afraid um, that um, uh, we can uh, observe um, uh, the latter uh, predominantly. And um, I think that um, uh, on the, uh, yet uh, it, is, it can be difficult to um, understand exactly how great um, the human rights challenges are. Uh, for instance, in the context of uh, handling extradition cases because um, uh, of the nature of uh, human rights violations, especially in the criminal process. Um, uh, much of, uh, some of the limitations of human rights safeguards um, that exist in the Chinese criminal process, we can understand um, from simply looking at uh, the black letter laws. Um, there are limitations that we can see that exist, for instance, with regard to um, the uh, right to silence, with regard to to access to criminal defense lawyers in the criminal process, um, et cetera. Um, but uh, there is also a lot of, again, um, uh, potential ambiguity from the perspective of outside actors looking at, say, the fact that, um, the, that China has, of course, um, criminalized the use of torture. It has uh, prohibited and ruled out, um, to some extent, um, the use of evidence um, uh, 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 that, uh, that is extracted um, uh, with torture in the criminal process and so on. So I think that to understand the problems of the criminal process uh, in China, ultimately it becomes uh, really necessary to engage in empirical research. And that of course, um, in China's so-called new era is becoming more and more difficult. Um, my own research um, with uh, Chinese criminal defense lawyers uh, and human rights lawyers has, um, uh, I think, made it uh, very clear that in particular access to counsel, access to legal counsel um, is one of the absolutely central human rights problems uh, that pervasively um, affects the criminal process, at least for all persons who are placed under custody, some form of, say, criminal investigation custody at the beginning of the process, and that remains the majority of persons um, going through this process. Um, uh, I, there is no time uh, to sort of give a, a full account of all of the problems that um, the uh, many human rights lawyers I've interviewed over the years um, have encountered, but perhaps suffice it to say that um, it generally, the problem generally starts with finding your client, because quite often um, uh, there is simply not enough information provided by the police uh, once it has detained a person as to you know, whether that person has been detained, by whom they have been detained and where they are being held. Um, and um, uh, the, uh, there are many problems of access to, um, uh, to, to clients, to people held, to, sus to effectively criminal suspects, um, or later in the process, defendants. Um, all of those process with access as a quick second point, um, of course, um, uh, hugely increase the danger 
of torture uh, in the criminal process um, because um, the less there is external um, help provided from that criminal defense lawyer who's so important as the one person sort of who um, can connect a criminal suspect to the outside world and that who can, for instance, um, gather information on torture having taken place. Um, the less access there is to legal counsel, the more likely, unfortunately, that torture occurs. And um, uh, uh, just quickly on this point as well, um, of course, we have, as a result of the criminalization of torture and various um, rules prohibiting and excluding um, uh, torture or risk torture evidence, um, also seen a trend towards white torture, towards um, torture methods that are less visible, or indeed um, recently, um, um, well, a, a, a recent increase, I should say, of methods such as forced drugging of criminal suspects um, uh, to make them compliant with the process of interrogation or perhaps even the trial process, um, but in ways that are very, very hard to trace after a while. Um, and the third um, point to say um, about this um, problem of um, um, uh, the, the sort of central human rights pro problems in the criminal process. Um, the third point that I would make is that um, at least um, from the experience of um, uh, empirical um, research uh, on uh, human rights and criminal defense lawyers, um, uh, the third problem, uh, a, a third problem I would mention here is that um, they themselves are very much at risk of human rights violations. Um, they end up essentially becoming their own clients. Um, they end up sort of representing each other in trials um, about um, uh, that uh, can involve um, criminal offenses, uh, allegations, uh, accusations of criminal offenses, ranging from falsification of evidence by lawyers all the way to um, accusations of uh, inciting political subversion or political subversion. And of course, it is the existence of such crimes, um, and this connects a little bit um, to um, um, uh, Professor Lin's um, important uh, lecture that kind of produces a wider chilling effect, um, um, pervasively affecting um, all of uh, all criminal uh, sort of defense mechanisms. And um, uh, there are plenty further problems in the criminal process that there's simply no time to uh, engage with here. But I think the overall point I would make is that um, it is not that easy to communicate effectively about these concerns to external legal actors, say a court engaged in um, handling an extradition request, um, or indeed um, a, a government in, engaged in handling such a request, um, because um, uh, understanding the problems um, arising in the criminal process does require um, a kind of in-depth look at what goes on on the ground. Um, we cannot entirely sort of understand the problems from um, just looking at legal frameworks. And um, I think that um, uh, the uh, sort of uh, related to extraditions, I think that um, as Mathieu also mentioned, um, in several cases, we have seen that um, it can be difficult um, to engage with um, the quality uh, of um, and the credibility in particular of diplomatic assurances that are made by the Chinese government. And uh, slightly ironically, sometimes the problem in these cases is uh, precisely that um, a kind of exceptional, uh, the exceptional status of um, extradition cases is actually used by the uh, government to argue that um, uh, there will be a higher standards of criminal justice and of human rights protection will be applied in cases that have um, uh, this kind of foreign element. Um, uh, we've seen that um, for instance, uh, looking a little bit beyond Europe in the recent uh, New Zealand and still ongoing New Zealand case um, uh, of extradition against Mr. Kim. The this last point that I would make um, is that um, uh, as we think about um, the problems and challenges of um, um, uh, sort of uh, global law enforcement and the um, the China's global law enforcement drive. Um, um, I think legal actors are 
very easily drawn into engaging specifically with the problem of extraditions because that at least provides us with a legal process um, to engage with. But of course, and uh, Mathieu mentioned that very quickly in, in passing earlier on, um, uh, when we think about um, what happens uh, would actually the, the various efforts that China is actually undertaking in terms of um, repatriating fugitives, um, fugitive suspects, um, uh, this uh, practice of Chenfan, of persuasion to return to China, is at least, I think, as important. And um, it is a very good illustration of the fact that um, uh, that the um, human rights violations um, that uh, China, the Chinese government practices domestically are increasingly gaining a transnational and global dimension. For instance, when a um, supposed alleged fugit fugitive abroad is persuaded to return to China because of threats of violence and human rights violations that are made against their relatives, their social environment uh, uh, still in China. Um, it is that kind of transnational dimension of China's human rights violations that I think sort of directly affects us also in what is in some ways um, uh, slightly misleadingly called China's global law enforcement drive. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Eva. What a thought-provoking um, comment. Um, any questions in the beginning? Otherwise, I might just start a conversation here in the five minutes you have left. Um, I'm I'm just relying now on on your last point, saying that you know how much can we rely on diplomatic assurances? And from my experience in law enforcement cooperation, it's all about trust. But we've seen now in, in a number of these comments that there is no trust, obviously. But will China just simply replace this trust with power? And because China is so powerful, people will comply out of fear and law enforcement will be circumvented? Um, thank you so much, Saskia. I think that's an important um, question. I would say that um, in a sense that uh, we, we can probably observe um, uh, that uh, a trend of that kind in a certain sense, um, uh, I think that it is uh, not, it is plausible that um, governments might be swayed in that way to um, be um, a little more credulous than perhaps they would be um, had China less geopolitical power, less economic clout, etc. Um, but what of course does become a problem so far as a legal process is involved. Um, um, the challenge sort of for the Chinese government, for the Chinese party state, I think is that um, uh, almost uh, invariably, um, they come up against a judicial process that kicks in at some point um, where there is a, a formal um, legal process, a formal extradition process. And so far as we are dealing with um, a constitutional democracy that um, practices separation of powers, so as far as we are dealing with um, a legal system that does not resemble the Chinese party state with its impressive concentration of powers and its complete rejection of um, uh, separation of powers. I think we um, do see that increasingly courts um, of law in um, European constitutional democracies um, uh, make decisions, um, uh, sort of decide to reject extradition on human rights grounds. Um, and so in that sense, the kind of constitutional difference that, that exists um, with liberal democracies uh, is a genuine obstacle, I think, to the party state, however much it might be able to um, influence governments, to influence economic actors, et cetera, et cetera. Um, uh, where courts are concerned, I think it is really, really difficult. Oh, I can see there are some chat comments. Um, I don't think there are any questions in the chat though. Yeah. Um, if there is a, a quick two minute questions, please, please raise your hand and ask the question. Yes, please. Thank you, Eva. 
my question is, you see, from what the Chinese government has said so far, the party state will be there in the foreseeable future. And in reality, the party has strengthened its research, its uh, control or leadership over all the other constitutional organs and has integrated the party organs with the state organs. So the question for you is under such a sort of uh, clearly opposite direction from the Western approach of separation of powers, how could or will it still be possible to have a sort of uh, uh, normal extradition there uh, between China and uh, democratic uh, states in EU, for example, or simply it's uh, unlikely in the future. Yeah, thank you so much. I mean, I think that um, the problem with uh, that integration of the party and the state for the criminal process is that, um, and I think we've really heard that uh, from Li Ling, um, uh, uh, as, as I read her work, um, is that um, it simply um, makes the um, uh, makes uh, human rights safeguards, effective human rights safeguards, impossible in the criminal process. That's kind of constructed, I think, into um, um, the way um, into the criminal process under a system where there is uh, no transparency, where there is no judicial independence where, um, as I just mentioned, criminal defense lawyers are suppressed, etc. And of course, I think, as I agree with you, that um, given the broader tendencies um, of the broader trajectory um, of the system, um, uh, it is it, there's no reason to think that any of these um, problems are going to be alleviated. I think the only um, possible consequence um, uh, to, to draw from that is that um, extradition into the Chinese criminal process um, is per se, uh, 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 per se uh, carries risks of grave human rights violations of the right to fair trial, the right um, not to be tortured, the right to liberty of person, and um, uh, that therefore um, uh, we should um, essentially um, uh, extradition agreements that have been concluded um, ought to be reversed. And for the time being, from my perspective, there should indeed be no uh, extradition to China. I recognize that um, that is not a desirable situation, but I would much prefer um, uh, seeing uh, persons uh, sort of remain in a, in a better process uh, might deserve punishment, um, not punished than to see them uh, exposed to extremely grave human rights risks if extradited. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Eva. And that's ending on a great and humane note um, for this panel. Thank you all so much for contributing. Thank you all for your fantastic talks and comments. Thanks to all the viewers and listeners for questions and participation. And um, yes, it's lovely to meet you all. Thank you for a great day and um, have a good rest of it. And yeah, I hope we see each other again in one of these interesting discussions soon. Yeah. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank, Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.